Herzlich willkommen im Gestaltcafé. Schön, dass du hier bist. Hier kannst du inspirierenden Gesprächen rund um das Thema Gestalttherapie lauschen. Ganz nach dem Motto des gleichnamigen Buches von Irving Polster, Jedes Menschenleben ist einen Roman wert, möchte ich in diesem Podcast mit meinen InterviewpartnerInnen die Gestaltarbeit erlebbarer und zugänglicher machen. Mein Name ist Katharina Renke, ich bin Gestalttherapeutin und angehende Psychologin und ich wünsche dir viel Spaß beim Zuhören. Herzlich willkommen zu dieser Folge des Gestaltcafé Podcasts. Heute spreche ich mit Dorothy Charles über das dialogische Prinzip in der Gestalttherapie. Warum kann es zu einem erfüllteren Leben führen, wenn wir wirklich in einem Gefühl von Interdependenz leben, anstatt nach Unabhängigkeit und Autonomie zu streben? Wie hat sich der Stil in der Gestalttherapie von Fritz Perls in Aslan, hier in Kalifornien, verändert hin zu einer mehr dialogisch, relational orientierteren Form der therapeutischen Arbeit. Ich freue mich, dass du dabei bist und ich wünsche dir viel Spaß beim Zuhören. I'm very happy to welcome Dorothy Charles in the Gestalt Coffee today. Thank you so much, Dorothy, that you take your time and sit with me here. Um, I would like to ask you um, maybe to introduce you a little bit to our listeners. Why is that place where we are right now special to you in terms of Gestalt? Yeah. Okay. Well, we're on the Esalen property and we're sitting on the deck of the Price House. Mm. And this was the house where uh, Dick Price and his wife Chris lived when they were here. Mm -hmm. And I met them um, and were my first Gestalt teachers. Mm -hmm. And so it's always special to come back and be in this environment where they lived and taught and were a part of the community. Mm. Yeah. And. Um, to put everything a little bit into a broader context. So right now, 40 years later, actually, mm -hmm. uh, you're teaching at Azalan, right. and I'm right now attending a course of yours. And in the last couple of days, we were um, also for all the people that attend a course that do not know what Gestalt therapy is, um, we were talking a lot about key terms of Gestalt practice. And um, yeah, we were thinking of a topic to talk mm -hmm. about. So I just picked the topic boundaries. Maybe, um, yeah, could we pick up on that a little bit? Like, why is the term boundary so important in the Gestalt practice and maybe also why is it or what what is it for you what does it mean for you okay mm. well i call what i do relational gestalt practice um, because it emphasizes the dialogic aspect of mm. the of the work um, and we talk a lot in gestalt about what's happening at the contact boundary um, And it used to be signified by this diagram where there would be a line, that's the boundary, and two separate circles, two people coming yeah. together and making contact. And now with neuroscience and you know the work has evolved, we can really see that as two overlapping circles, that there's always mutual influence going on in the relationship. Mm. And so that the boundary isn't like this hard, fixed line. And if you look at um, the evolution of the work, um, if you look at Fritz Perl's sessions, um, you can see them on YouTube in various places. Um, he's very much in the role of the, it's the doctor-patient model. Mm -hmm. um, and he has the knowledge and, you know, works with the person and does so brilliantly about bringing things into the foreground and listening to tone of voice and posture and things like that um, and using those in the session. He doesn't, however, reflect on how 
who he is and how he's working with the person also informs what's happening or is not happening. Um, and then my uh, primary teacher, Dick Price, um, had been intruded a lot in his healing process. So he set up a system where he was not the expert, the person working, called he called the initiator, was the expert on themselves, and he was a reflector or a guide, and that was his model. Would you explain to me a little bit what uh, did Price mean by being intruded in his healing process? Yeah, um, he had um, a break as a young man. He'd already been through Stanford, he'd already mm -hmm. been in the military, he was married, and he, he had a, a break. Um, and he was then, um, his family had taken him to uh, a mental hospital or mm -hmm. a facility called the Institute for Living um, on the East Coast. And he didn't know it was a locked facility, so he was there in a locked facility. Okay. He received a lot of electric shock and insulin shock treatment, which he responded very badly to put him in, in, in poor health. Um, and he, you know, he felt like he was being brutalized for needing help and needing you know, to, to process what was happening. And instead of getting curious about what he was experiencing, he felt like You know, they were trying to blot out his consciousness in a certain way. And so um, one of his desires in creating Eslin is that it would be a place that had a more humanistic approach mm -hmm. and that people could come and be in this amazing nature mm -hmm. and eat healthy food and have community and like-minded people around, get body work, um, things like that. and and to trust their own process of unfolding mm -hmm. and to um, get curious about it, have some patience with it and be um, supported in that unfolding rather than a, you know, covering over or and you know, speaking forcing. In the, in the, in the um, picture that you brought up with the two circles yes. and the boundaries, yeah. what, be intru what would intruding be using that picture or metaphor for you? Well, you're you're delusional, you're not uh, speaking about things that are in part of our consensual reality, I'm going to give you an antipsychotic because right. instead, you know, what I learned from him is these stories or narratives which don't make sense to me, make sense to the person. And how can I show up with some patience, tolerance and curiosity and just listen and sure enough start to see that there is some meaning for the person and it's my job to join them where they are instead of forcing them to come back to my perspective or my mm -hmm. way of experiencing the world. Does that answer? Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, I think I would like to make the connection to the term boundary again. Mm -hmm. So you said you were talking about your development of your personal style mm -hmm. to practice Gestalt. Could you um, say a little bit about um, more about the term boundary in this context? Yeah. Well, it's you know it's this sense of being in touch with where I end and mm. you begin. Okay. That, that we yeah. are separate yeah. beings, um, and that I want to respect mm. your physical space, your emotional space, your intellectual space, your spiritual space. That I understand that you are Sekunde. Mm. In up. Are we having a technical? Yeah. <laughs> Siri would like to join the conversation. Siri <laughs> does that sometimes. <laughs> She likes that. Yeah. Got uh -huh, it. Uh huh. Uh huh. And um, so, one of the things that that I teach in the workshops is um, how important being able to identify mm -hmm. our emotions is and to express them skillfully or to decide to hold and not express mm -hmm. and how that really can inform our relationships and our ability to be present with ourselves and other people, to be in touch with what's happening mm -hmm. with us on that sensate um, you know, emotional level. Like all, all emotions arise as sensation in the body. Mm -hmm. um, and so understanding and respecting that whatever I am feeling in this moment, you may be having a very different uh -huh. 
feeling and so that's important and also what it reminds me of like being aware of my emotions can and also my inner responses to what you are saying as my uh, as the person sitting next to me so yes. I think that's what you were talking about earlier this morning when you said you you had a rather relational approach to gestalt mm -hmm. that you as a therapist are also were aware that the way you are, the way you sit with somebody would have an in impact, influence yes. on the other person. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Uh -huh. It's really important to keep that in my awareness. Yeah. So, um, someone sitting you know, on the open seat might, might be crying and then I say something and then I notice they sort of start holding, holding back or maybe shutting down a little bit. Mm. And I believe it's my job at that point to get curious about what just happened or did I say or do something right. that's causing you to have this response. I feel very touched when you say that. Also I felt earlier that, I mean, I can listen now to my voice um, breaking a little bit even because it's um, it makes me very soft when I hear you mm -hmm. saying that. Mm -hmm. and I heard you s talking about a breakthrough, a gestalt breakthrough. Um, what would you rather use in terms of words for a person realizing something or um, like finishing an unfinished business instead of br a breakthrough? What would you call it? Or Well, Maybe having a new insight or a sense of completion, mm -hmm. having, you know, put the person on the cushion and had several conversations. And then at one point in this conversation, something shifts for me. Uh -huh. I get to express something or say something that in my organism, I get a sense of a letting go or a more sense of completion, mm -hmm. whatever that would mean on a physical level. But um, it could be something about understanding something about myself mm -hmm. instead of explaining. Fritz would talk a lot about the difference between explaining and understanding. Okay. And so that means that with understanding I can see a whole, a bigger picture and it's not just an intellectual construct about what's happening. It's like, oh, I am grieving my mother's death. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about my early childhood and I have an understanding, okay, she had trauma, she had it difficult too. But when I can sit here and talk to her over there as a young woman with four children when she was, you know, 26 or 27, oh, there's a feeling that arises in my body that there's some empathy there or there's a real sense of being in, 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 in contact mm -hmm. that hadn't been uh, true before. Mm -hmm. And so then there's a, there's a change, there's a, there's a difference in my, there's a, so, a softening is, is a, another way that you might describe it. But for some people it's about their righteous anger and their right to have that and their right to express that, no yeah. holds barred, you know. So there are different flavors of it, but it's about being the per permission and that thinking mind, feeling core, being connected mm -hmm. and together and that full expression of mm -hmm. this myself whatever it happens to be in that moment yeah when you say that I I'm thinking of a line that I was reading the other day like in Gestalt maybe the you experience the I at the boundary at the contact boundary mm -hmm. so that's yeah. what comes to my mind when mm -hmm. you say that yeah. and s having said all that I would like to ask you again to um, speak a little bit about self-support and support of others because that's what we mentioned this morning in this context and it also mm -hmm. it reminded me actually a lot of my teacher he was very much focusing in the first year on the self-support so mm -hmm. that we were like able to um, like speak up trust ourselves be honest mm -hmm. and then things shifted and he would also say that it's very important not only yeah that we can grow just when we interact mm -hmm. 
and yeah mm -hmm. how how does that fit into your idea of relational gestalt practice mm -hmm. well that we develop in relationship and so who we are who we become how we cope in our lives is a result of those relationships and so if we find areas of our life that aren't working or that you know we repeat patterns that we're not happy with and we're not feeling like we're as fulfilled in our lives as we'd like to be then it's important to have the awareness so here's the habit of behavior or the belief I carry that's mm -hmm. that's the awareness is the first and most important step but then the step of being related to differently than I was to have that belief or that pattern put in place is also I think essential mm -hmm. And so that's it, that it's relational, that I can't do this healing work or self-discovery in a vacuum on my own. I really need other people mm. to see that I'm different in certain ways, to have myself reflected back mm -hmm. like that. Um, and so how do I... I mean, the great thing about group is, you know, one awareness is good and two is better, a whole room full of people mm -hmm. showing up and being, you know, curious, having some patience and tolerance, being kind to themselves and other people sitting in, in, the, in the room can mm -hmm. really, well, I think it's essential, really, mm -hmm. for, for living our lives fully, so, um, yeah, and the the self-support so Fritz so all people I believe who create psychological theory uh, are finding a way to see themselves and their lives and uh -huh. what they need yeah and he came from a very harsh background and he learned early on to be self-reliant because it wasn't safe to need the environment and so he talks about maturation a lot in his writings and for him it's very much about going from environmental support to self-support right now for me, for my organism, the way I see the world, he went, that's all, that's true, it's valid. And you can take that too far. So rather than from dependence to independence and leaving it there, I add in interdependence. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's where boundaries are important mm -hmm. to understand um, both parties' needs. Or as a group leader, I balance, I try to balance the group uh, the needs of the individuals in the in the group mm -hmm. with the group needs as a whole like that and so that's where boundary work comes in and how do you like mm, why was it personally important to you to develop the understanding of interdependence if I may ask that question um, because I um, was a parentified child. I'm the eldest of four. And so looking after other people and taking care of their needs mm. uh, made me pretty self-reliant. I was there to help and support. I wasn't there to receive help and support mm -hmm. so much. Um, and then coming to Esalen, being part of a community, working with Dick and Chris, their support, their presence, um, and their emotional support felt so good mm. but it was almost like do I have the right to this do I have permission I'm breaking an old rule I'm doing something that I shouldn't be doing I'm getting dependent you know all those thoughts mm. would come in and I got to see no it's it's really important that I can give support and receive support mm. and that that's um, a healthier model mm -hmm. than how can I take care of you and how can I show up for you so that I can be okay. Yeah. yeah. A healthier model, or you earlier mentioned a term that would lead to a more fulfilling life for you. Or yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah. Yeah, to have relationships that are reciprocal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Where that's appropriate. Obviously, not with your kids or your maybe quite elderly people in your family, but for mm -hmm. everybody else, that there's reciprocity. Mm -hmm. It's important. Mm -hmm. Well, Thank you so much, Dorothy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm yeah. very excited to be part of this Esalen experience right mm -hmm. now, and yeah. yeah, I enjoy very much that mm -hmm. you uh, that I can bring a little bit of this magic or of the history mm -hmm. within 
through this interview to the people that are running Gestalt or are interested in it to Germany. Yeah, you're very welcome. Thank yeah. you for asking me. And it's been a pleasure having you in the group. Mm -hmm. I'm really glad that you're here and participating with all of us. Yeah. Thank you. Schön, dass du in dieser Folge im Gestaltcafé zu Gast warst. Wie immer lade ich dich zum Schluss ein, in deinen eigenen inneren Dialog mit dem zu treten, was du gerade gehört hast. Bis zum nächsten Mal.